All right, I'm excited. Uh, just a couple things. Number one, if you didn't notice, we uh, finally this week we finished our New Life Cafe. How many are excited about that? So we want to help uh, as a pastor and a step. We want to help feed your addiction. Uh, so we built the cafe, and people are like, "What? Why did you do that?" And uh, well, a couple reasons. Our church just continues to get bigger and bigger, and it's just one way for us to um, just to kind of hang out together. I was here on Wednesday night before the youth service, and I, I went out by the cafe, and they did kind of a soft launch, and there was a ton of kids just sitting there and drinking coffee and playing games. And so we want to really encourage you to get here before the service starts, so you can hang out after, grab a cup of coffee, and it's going to be open Monday night for training for life, Tuesday night for the institute, Wednesday night for our youth service. Thursday night for recovery. Uh, it'll be open uh, every Sunday, you, about 7.30 in the morning till probably 2, 2.30 or so. And so it's just awesome. Bring, bring your friends and family and uh, buy a coffee here. It's a little cheaper than any local coffee store. We're not trying to make money. We're just trying to create an a avenue where you can hang out and drink some coffee. And, and I, I would just ask you this. All of the workers uh, back there are young adults, some of them are in high school, and I would just ask you to be super kind. They're still working out the kinks, super kind, the word is, and, and honor, and if they mess up your drink, just say, hey, no problem, uh, can you make it again? They'd be happy to do that. Uh, just really, I gotta be honest with you, it really grieves me and when I hear from our staff and our volunteers that people in our church treated them poorly and with an attitude, and when an usher asks you to sit in a certain seat and you tell them, I'm not moving, like people tell them, I'm not moving, Really? Where's the heart of Jesus there? And when a greeter asks you something or a volunteer asks you to do something or you get ticked off because um, you didn't sign up or we didn't do something right, we have, a, we have 500 volunteers and we can't, I personally can't control 500 volunteers. They're trying to do their best. I can tell you they're not getting paid for what they do. They work full-time jobs like you do. And so don't give them an attitude. Be kind. Let's honor one another. I really think our church would be super successful in the eyes of God if we can do what Philippians 2 says. Ready for this verse? Prefer other people is more important than yourself. So inside you might be, oh, I don't want to move in that seat. But yes, God bless you. I'd be happy to move. So let's just treat people with, uh, the word I'm thinking of is just, let's honor people. There's so, there's so very little honor in our culture. And, and I just want, uh, I want this to be one church that we just honor the presence of God and the people of God. Can I get an amen? Because you're looking at me like you're ticked off at me already. Okay. The second thing I want to say before I dive into the Bible is a lot of people have been asking me, what are the next steps with our church? And uh, of the four services today, this might be one of the smaller services is for sure this one and the fourth. The second and third are packed. And uh, what are the next steps for our church? And we're not really sure. We would love to buy this building, but we know that buying this building only handles the present problem that we have because we're already in four and we're willing to go five or six or whatever it is. But we would, I, personally, I would love to preach two services and I start losing my voice about the middle of the third, but I'll do whatever God asks me to do because we're just trying to reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ. We want to buy this building, but again, that just gets us to where we're at. We need to expand. We need to grow. And so there was some talk about buying the building behind us, which is 10,000 square feet bigger. So we could, I don't know, we're just praying. We, we could build a sanctuary over there and add more classrooms and offices. That would be great. But the owner said, we can sell both of you for, ready, drum roll, $14 million. And that's a lot of money, and we don't have nearly $14 million. And you're like, I know you're thinking, you're like, somebody in our church is really rich, and they're going to write a big check. No. <laughs> It doesn't happen that way. It happens uh, where 4,000 people do what they can. And uh, I got to be honest with you, I hate building programs. I hate getting up in front of the church and talking about money and giving. And do you know, this is so true. If everybody in our church that calls New Life their home, if you would just do this, if you would just do what the Bible says, tithe, we wouldn't even have to do a building campaign. In fact, it would be, we would have to say, hey, stop giving. It's too much. Wouldn't that be a great problem? That happened in the Old Testament. Do you know that? They, they got so much money, they're like, we can't do it, right? So let's just do our part and let's just see. How many know God has a part, but we have a part? And it's going to be 4,000 people doing what they can, 11 people clapping their hands. Um, so we're not really sure. You'll probably hear about more about this in the next four or five weeks. And uh, we're excited about the future that God has for us. And uh, I'm, I'm excited. Anybody else excited? Yeah. Amen. So uh, 21 years ago, we had 40 people. Here we are, three, 4,000 people later, and God's been really good to us. Turn to somebody and say, he's been really good. Really good. Daniel chapter 3. All right, Daniel chapter 3. 
Commercials are over. We're ready to open up the Word of God. We want to welcome back anybody that was on the Haiti team. We had 15 people go to Haiti. Five, five of them got really, really sick, um, really sick. One uh, so sick that he couldn't come to church today, but they were throwing up and uh, it was bad, but uh, the ministry was good. And Pastor Andrew led that team, so thank God for Pastor Andrew. Yeah. Uh, so here we are, Daniel chapter 3. If you were not here last week, we started a brand new series. The title of the series is called, it's on the title, of your, uh, on the front of your notes there. Say, say it with me. Stand. And we said that uh, last week out of Daniel 1, we said that we need as Christians to, to stand out. But remember I said not in the weird way, not in the wrong way, not in the creepy way, because there's a lot of weird Christians. You're sitting next to one probably. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? Just like there's some weird Christians out there and they're just like, really in your face? You're just like, you're weird. And uh, a lady told me years ago, she said, that's interesting that you're talking about the blood because the Lord woke me up and told me to wear a red dress. And now it's not an accident that you were talking about the blood. I was just like, come on, you can't say it, but inside you're like, doo, 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 doo. you're weird. Anyhow, there are some weird Christians. They don't go to the fourth service. They go to the first three, though. You should try to visit one of those services. They're weird. We don't want to stand out that way. We want to stand out in the right way. Someone say the right way. And uh, so stand out, uh, Daniel 1. Today we're going to talk about standing firm in our faith, Daniel chapter 3. And let me just give you a little context to Daniel chapter 3 before we start reading. You don't want to just start jumping into a passage if you don't know what's going on. Uh, Babylon was a really wicked uh, place. If, you were to, if I were to ask you what are some of the most godless cities in the United States, somebody might say San Francisco or Hollywood or Las Vegas, and you might be true. Uh, Babylon, you would take all those three cities I just mentioned and times it by like a million, and that would be Babylon. On. They were wicked. They, they would actually worship multiple gods, the fertility god, the sun god, all these different gods. And anybody that, that, that worshiped the right god, Yahweh, they would, they, would, they, they would crucify, they would kill. And so Babylon was a really bad place, led by a very bad person. His name is King Nebuchadnezzar. And what would happen in Babylon is sometimes they would go into uh, rival countries and nations and they would capture uh, young uh, Jewish boys, and they would make them slaves. And that's what's going on in Daniel 3. They capture actually quite a, quite a few, but in particular, three guys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, uh, I just want to find out where I'm at. How many have ever heard the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, okay? And if you're not careful, we, we've heard it, and you're like, hey, I've heard this before, great. I've, I've personally preached on this five or six times in 21 years. I've read the passage dozens and dozens of times. But let me know, uh, it's good to hear old things over and over again, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And sometimes I'll read a passage, and I'm like, are you, I've never seen that ever in my life. And I've just read, like I just read it a month ago. And I mean, God shows us new things all the time. And uh, so we're going to talk about how to stand firm in our faith like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I just feel led to pray right now before we dive in. Is it okay? Yes. So Lord, thank you for our time together. We ask your blessing upon the Word of God. Thank you that the Word of God comes to correct and rebuke and teach. And we thank you for the Holy Spirit that is here in the room. And we just pray that God's Word would have free course to move in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray a specific prayer for my Cincinnati Bengals that play tonight at 5.30. They are a seven-point underdog on the road against Kansas City. But give them favor and grace, we pray in Jesus' name. And I'm tired of the New England Patriots. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. That was weird. That was weird. Okay. So uh, someone said, someone said, I don't know who said this many years ago. Someone said a picture is worth uh, a, thousand. a thousand words. So instead of giving you points, all of the points, I want to give you three pictures that I discovered out of Daniel chapter 3, if it's okay. Yeah. Here we go. Three pictures. Picture number one, write this in your notes. The first picture I want to talk about is a picture of idolatry. Idolatry. Say that word with me before you write it down. I, idolatry. Write that down in your notes there. Number one, point number one, a picture of idolatry. Pastor Steve, where did you get that in the text? Well, I got it in verses one through seven, and I'm ready to start reading. So if you're ready for me to read, just say go. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold 60 cubits high and six cubits wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Big image. He then summoned the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials to come to the dedication of the image he set up. So the satraps, prefects, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the other provincial officials assembled for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they, keyword, and they stood before it. Verse 4. Then... The herald or a messenger loudly proclaimed. Can you kind of hear him there with this big 
microphone, and here's what he says. Nations and peoples of every language, this is what you are commanded to do. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, not really sure what that is. Anybody know what a zither is? Maybe we should get one for the worship team. Anyhow, when you hear the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipe, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold the king Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down and worship with, will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn and all these instruments, notice this, grab your pen there and circle this word, all the nations. Circle that word all. All the nations and peoples of every language. Let me read it again. All the nations and peoples of every language fell down and worshiped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So let me give you a little picture going on in the text. So King Nebuchadnezzar builds this image, this statue, and it's nine feet wide. Do you have that picture in your mind? Nine, nine feet wide. And it's 90 feet or nine stories high. And it's a gold image. I mean, that, that's big. We're not really sure how long it took. We're not even sure what was on the, if there was an inscription on the image itself. It could have been just been gold, which I'm thinking, man, if we sold that, we could buy a couple of buildings. Uh, anyhow, and so here, here was the instruction. When the music starts playing, and we're not sure what the music is, I'm thinking it was probably that song at Disneyland when you're on the boat on that ride where they sing and all those different languages called It's a Small World. So let's just say they were like, when you hear the It's the Small World, then, then you're, everybody's to bow down. Now, I want you to see that they weren't looking for 25% participation or 50% par participation or 75 or even 95% participation. What King Nebuchadnezzar was looking for was what? 100%. I want all of the people from every language and every nation, when you hear the music being played, I want you to bow down. And, and even when I had you write the word idolatry, a picture of idolatry, some of you are like, come on. Because like, when I think about the word of idolatry, what goes to my mind immediately is I'm thinking like of a statue, like a Buddha statue or a totem pole. And I'm like, well, we don't, we don't really worship statues like that. Some people do, but for the most of us, we don't. And so King Nebuchadnezzar said, when you hear the music, bow down. And so the word idolatry is just, here it is. The word idolatry is anything in our life that we elevate above our relationship with Christ. So is it okay if I break that down? Okay. So how many know that can be power? If we're not careful, the, we're addicted to power. And if I can just get the, the, the office and be the vice president, the manager, and my whole life is about getting power and powering up on people. If you're not careful, power, prestige, possessions can be an idol in our life, true or false. I mean, money can be an idol. And by the way, people quote this all the time. They're like, money is the root of all evil. Not true. The love of money is the root of all evil. And can I say this? I don't think God really minds that you have a nice car or a nice house or a boat or something. Just don't let those things have you. Be a very generous person. Be a, be a giver. But if God blesses you like Abraham, then so be it. But I got to make sure I don't let money or cars or my job or people be an idol in my life. I, I got to be honest with you. For me, I've had to be very careful since I've come to Christ. If I'm not careful, pray for me. Sports can be an idol in my life. Not only playing them, watching them, losing my mind when my team loses. Like I, I, just, I, I found myself recently, like I'm not even really a fan of whatever the team is, but I'm, I'm mad when the game's over. Like, why are you getting so upset? It's not that big of a deal in light of eternity. So I, I love sports, nothing wrong with sports. I play all kinds of sports, but I mean, you know, sports can be an idol. Our job can be an idol. Our relationship can be an idol. Our, 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 our friendships, our relationship, our boyfriend, our girlfriend, our fiance, if we're not careful, can be a, an idol. Anything that elevates itself over our relationship with Christ. Did I tell you that years ago, I was riding my motorcycle with a friend through the canyons near Malibu, and we stopped at this restaurant, and there's, it's called the Rock Store. There's a bunch of guys that show up from all over, and they bring their bicycle there, and they get lunch or breakfast or something. And I, I, I parked my bike, and right when I parked my bike, a guy pulled right up next to me with a nicer bike than mine. It was, it was actually beautiful. And I said, that is a beautiful bike. He said, are you interested in buying it? And I said, no, but it's beautiful. And he goes, well, if you want to buy it, it was like $12,000. And I'm like, no, my wife would kill me, but uh, it's a nice bike. And here's what he said to me. He said, I'm, I'm downsizing. I'm trying to get rid of some bikes. I said, some bikes? I said, how many bikes do you have? And he says, I have 42 motorcycles. 
And I said, where do you keep them? He goes, I have a three-car uh, three garage. I live in Simi Valley, two-story house. Half of my motorcycles are in the three-car garage. The rest of them I had to build like a, a deck off of the back, an overhang, and, and the other 20 or so are out there. And I said, what does your wife say about that? Here's what he said. He said, well, I'm not married anymore. <laughs> and I didn't say it, but I thought it. I said, oh, yes, you are married. You're just not married to a woman. You're married to a motorcycle, 42 of them. How many know that can be an idol in our life? So a picture of idolatry. So when you hear the music, it's a small world after all. Bow down. 99.9% .9 of the people bow down. Three guys decide they're not going to do it. They're going to stand and stand firm. By the way, most theologians tell us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were between 13 and 15 years old. I, I want to talk to all of our young people in church today. God is looking for some young people, some elementary, junior high, high school, and young adults that in the middle of this compromising culture will stand for Jesus Christ and having done all to stand. So number one, a picture of idolatry. Number two is a picture of integrity. Write that down in your notes, a picture of integrity. In other words, when 99% of the people were bowing down, these three guys were not bowing down. I don't have time to read eight, uh, verses 8 through 15. Let me just kind of tell you what's going on. So everybody bows down except the three. Question, is King Nebuchadnezzar excited now that three guys aren't bowing down? Or is he like totally ticked off and enraged? So why don't you vote, A or B? The answer is B. He's mad. So he says, hey, you go get those three guys and you tell them to come back to the palace right now. Aura. So they come back and they're like, hey, is it true? When you heard the music, you didn't bow down. And they're like, yeah, you're exactly right. We did not bow down. So they said, you are going into the fiery furnace. So they turned up the heat. And check out what the Bible says in verses 16, 17, and 18. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to him. Look at your Bible there. King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. Someone just say, awesome. They're like, I know you're, you're really fired up and stuff, but... We don't have to defend ourselves in this matter. Oh, yes, you do. Check it out. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. Notice the respect there. Calls him majesty. But even if he does not, we want you to know your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. How awesome is that? I am so fired up about verses 17 and 18. Check this out. They're actually saying three things. Would you look at me? Number one, they're saying, hey, first of all, our God is able. Let me just ask you a question. How many of you came to church today believing God is able? And some of, some of you might not. You're like, I don't, I don't know if he's going to come through for me in this situation. I came to church for four services on October 21st, 2018 to let you know he is able. I don't know what you're going through. God is able. Turn to somebody and say, he's able. Come on, he's able. Now let's say it out loud. God is able. I speak faith in your life. He's what? He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. I, I honestly, 100% of me believes he is able. Pastor Andrew, you believe that? I believe he's able. He can do anything. Yep. But this is the God that just opens his mouth and he flings stars into space. He's able. But they said not only is he able, number two, he is able. Number two, he will deliver. I got to be honest with you. I'm 100% I'm in on the he is able. Here's where I get tripped up. Anybody else? He will do it though. Like just, I, I just talked about the building. Can, question, can God provide $14 million for us to move in? Yes. So I, I'm not struggling with that at all. Here's my struggle. Will he do it? Yes. Will he? And when will he do it? I know he can. I, I've heard a lot of stories, friends of mine. Oh yeah, I get friends in like Colorado and Kansas. You're not gonna believe this. The city just gave us 50 acres. So inside, I'm like, you little sucker. Out, I'm like, oh, praise God. That's awesome. Yeah, you live in Kansas. They're not giving away acreage here in Southern California on the coast. So can, can God do it? Yes, he can. But I, I want to know, will he do it for me and our church? That's what I struggle with. So they said, no, oh, God is able. Number two, he will do it. And I came to church for some people that know that God is able, but you're wondering if he'll do it for you. And he will. And in his timing, by the way. I've said this a lot, um, we're, into, we're into microwaving. I mean, we want it like, get now, God, I need it by Friday noon. And he's not into microwaving, he's into marinating. 
He's like, no, you're not ready right now because you're too prideful. And if I gave it to you right now, you'd be walking in pride. How many are grateful, by the way, that God did not answer certain prayers that you prayed? Because you'd be married to some crazy people. And so would I. So how many of God knows better? We just say his ways are better than our ways. So he is able, number two, he will. This is the best part of the verse 18. He says to King Nebuchadnezzar, hey, our God is able. He will deliver. But number three, verse 18, even if he doesn't, even if God doesn't come through, even if God doesn't heal me, even if God doesn't give me a job this week, even if I never get married, even if we're never able to have kids, even if I'm not bowing down, I'm not turning my back on Jesus Christ, he's been too good to me. Somebody should be putting their hands together right now. Even if. Let me ask you, you're 45 years old and you thought you'd be buried at 25. And here you are 20 years later and you see all your friends getting married, people in the church getting married. But will you serve God even if you have to wait another year, two years, five years? You've been wanting to have kids and people around you are having kids. I want to know, will you still serve God even if you don't get pregnant for another six months or two years? Even if you got a bad diagnosis from the doctor, but will you remain faithful and endure for Jesus Christ even if you don't get the job, the right job, you don't get accepted to the college, things don't go your way? Hey, praise God for all the people, the miracles that God does. I wanna know if there's anybody that's gonna serve him even if things don't go your way and the way that you think God should move. Now listen, they said, hey, God is able, he will do it, and even if he doesn't, I'm still in. All in for Jesus Christ, because he was all in for me. A picture of integrity, even if. Someone say, even if. Yes. So I was thinking this week, because I, I have a tendency to be an excuse maker. Anybody else? I was thinking about a couple of excuses these guys could have come up with. Number one, I was thinking, well, they could have just said it's the order of the king. Come on, man, when the king says to do something, when the government says to do something, you have to bow down, just do what he says. But they didn't do that. How about this? They could have said, because they're slaves in Babylon, they could have said, hey, number two, this is going to blow my career. Because I mean, if you're a slave in the palace, you're probably either carrying out sewage, ew, or maybe you're peeling grapes in the kitchen. I'd rather peel grapes than carry out sewage. So they could have said, hey, this is going to, this is going to blow our future. It's going to blow our job. It's going to affect our career. But they didn't bow down. I thought about this. They could have said, hey, we're far from home. When in Rome, do like the Romans do. Hey, if we bow down, our parents aren't going to know, our friends aren't going to know, our church isn't going to know. Let's just go with it. But they didn't do it. They could have said everybody else is doing it. And can I just say this? It doesn't matter what other people are doing. We're just here to please the audience of one. They could have said, hey, if we don't bow, we could be jailed, imprisoned, or killed. But they still didn't bow. Now, I know we have a tendency to, we already know the end of the story, right? How many have ever... You wanted to watch the Raider game they played on Sunday night or Monday night and you were at a meeting or you were at church and you're like, hey, let's DVR the game as a family. Have you ever done that before? I've done that before. We're like, hey, we can't watch the game together because of whatever, we have a meeting, but let's all watch it tonight. And so we DVR the game and on the way home, I'm so impatient. I get on my ESPN app and I'm like, I already saw the Yankees won, and we're all watching the game. And how I many know when you already know that your team won, you watch the game differently than people that don't? So people in the living room, they're like losing their mind. Come on, man, Derek Carr, you're killing us. Right? And you're like, just chill out, man. What are y'all stressed about? They're like losing their mind, throwing the remote control across the living room. You're just like, you're just kind of sitting there like, no, it's good. They're like, what are you so calm about? Nothing. You're over there eating like hot Cheetos and stuff and they're like just losing their mind. And why, you already know the end. And I read the story, I already know the end of the story. Okay, there was four people in the furnace and they, they didn't even smell like smoke, that's awesome. But they didn't know, they didn't know that. They didn't DVR this situation and still they live their life with integrity. Which brings me to the third point. Ready for the third point? So I had idolatry, I had integrity. I'm like, I need another I word. Because that would be dumb, I, I, then like F. <laughs> so I did my little thesaurus, and here's what I came up with. See if you like it. You can vote. Number three, a picture of, here it is, invincibility. You like it? Yeah. Come on, vote if you like it. Thumbs up. Excellent, thanks. 
Good, good. Excellent. Write it down. Invincibility. If you don't know how to spell, look at the screen here. Invincibility. Invincibility. What do I mean by that? That when God's on your side, you and I are invincible. You and I are invincible. So let me just kind of uh, summarize verse 19 through 23. They refuse to bow. King Nebi gets ticked off, even more enraged, throws him into the furnace and demands that the furnace get turned up seven times hotter. Everybody look right into my eyes. I'm not the kind of pastor that gets up here and says, okay, everybody, if you make a choice for Jesus, make him your choice, you will drive a Rolls Royce. <laughs> and all your problems go away. And it's going to be awesome serving the Lord. And, and you're not going to have any persecution. And there's going to be no suffering. And you're going to have more than enough money. I'm not that guy because the Bible's not that. I'm the guy that says, hey, if you make a decision to really go after Jesus Christ, you will have problems. You are going to have an issue. And I'm telling you, and the more radical stance you take for Jesus Christ, even more problems. Why? Because when you were a non-Christian, the devil didn't really care about you. He already had you. Once you say, hey, I'm going to serve God. Now there's a big bullseye on your back. He's like, okay, we'll see. You know what I'm talking about? And, but I'm t so they say, hey, it's going to get hotter. And I'm telling you, if you're going to stand up for Christ and live a devoted life, it's going to get hotter in your life. It's going to get more intense. But the good news is he's able, he will deliver. And even if he doesn't, I'm on God's team. Somebody else? I love, uh, how many have ever been to a first Wednesday service? It's so awesome. Our worship team always tells me, man, I wish every Sunday service was like first Wednesday. And I'm like, well, you guys don't understand. Because we have four services, and every service like this one, you have some people that are just on fire, jump around, yell, scream. There's going to be maybe 25, 30%. You're going to have other people that are new to Christ, and they're just kind of like, what are you all excited about? Some people are brand new, and they're just like, this is different. This is what is going on here. What's up with the screens? And they don't get And So you have a lot of different people in every service. But when you get a, a first Wednesday service, all the crazy fanatical Christians, like the 25% in every service, they show up on Wednesday night. Because anybody can go to church on Sunday morning. It's traditional. We come out of obligation. Anybody that comes on first Wednesday, it's just like, woo. And so right when they start playing, it's just like, it's insane. And here it is awesome. And I love the worship and I love the prayer. And I, but I love the very end. We do these testimonies. Like five people get up. Hi, uh, I just want to let. You, I, 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 I've been without a job for like two months, and I, I, I had somebody in the church pray for me, and I just really began to stand on the word of God, and I started fasting, and this week God gave me a job. We're just like, oh. And me and my husband, we just weren't getting along, and somebody said, try church, and so we went to one of the services. We both gave our hearts to the Lord, and our marriage has never been better. It was like awesome, and I, I love all those stories. I love hearing about what God did and. But I, I want to know, is there anybody in our church in this service right now? Not that God already has come through for you, but you are in the furnace right now. Because praise God that when he comes through, when he heals you, when he delivers you, when he sets you free, when he heals you, that, that's great. But can you still worship God in the middle of the furnace? Because that, that's the testimony that really fires me up. Hey, Pastor Steve, I am going through hell right now with my job, hell in my marriage, hell with my kids. I just lost my job. But you know what? Even if things don't turn around, I'm still going to serve God. That's the kind of testimony that fires me up. Because anybody can worship and praise God on the back end. I want to know if there's anybody in the service in the middle, in the fire right now. The enemy's turning up the heat. You're like, hey, man, bring it on. God is still good. I will never leave him nor forsake him because he's never done it for me. Is there anybody in this service? Listen, right now, you're, you're just going, just be honest. You're just going, you're in the furnace right now. Relational furnace, financial furnace, medical furnace. Raise your hand. I want to pray for you right now. I want to pray for you. Put your hand down, then I'm going to just say a couple things, and I'll have you raise it again. Check this out. If you read chapter 3 of Daniel, this is so awesome. You only see Jesus one time in the entire chapter. And where do you find him? in the furnace. In other words, God shows up best in the furnace. You're like, well, that's cool that you got like a verse to share, but do you have like a personal experience? Yeah, I can take you back three years when I had a sub anacroid hemorrhage, brain hemorrhage. That just sounds demonic, doesn't it? sub anacroid Why don't you have a sub anacroid hemorrhage? And uh, so they, they put me on a helicopter from Oxnard to Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital, and because uh, you could bleed out, you could you, actu you could actually die. Somebody's like, "So how was the helicopter ride?" I'm like, 
It's like a dumb question. I don't know. I wasn't like, oh, it's so beautiful. Check out the coast. No. Um, so so two, two weeks I was in ICU and you're like, well, what did you experience? Well, it was hard. I was set back for a couple months and and there's a lot of cool things that happened in those two weeks. The best being my wife coming every day just to encourage me, people coming by and praying for me and reading the Bible over me. And, but in the furnace for two weeks for sure. And you're like, well, where was God at? I can tell you, he met me in ways in the hospital that I've never met him in ways before. I'm just telling you, he's faithful in the furnace of your life. And I'm a personal example of that. So if that's you, lift your hand right now. I want to pray for you all over the building. I pray for, in the name of Jesus, I declare whatever furnace you're going through that the God will never leave you, never forsake you. In fact, he's gonna show up today and this week in your life in the name of Jesus, I declare that. He will never ever leave you nor forsake you. Even if it's felt that way, listen, God just saying, hey, my son, my daughter, I hear your cry. I know what you're going through and I'm here. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, Amen. aren't you glad that we're more than conquerors. Greater is he, Jesus, that's in me than he that's in the world. The Bible says that he makes a way when there seems to be no way. How are you going to get out of this? You just lost your job. You got bills. You got 10 days to pay your rent. I, I don't know. But he's going to make a way. You made a way. When my back was against the wall and it looked as if it was over, you made a way. And I'm standing here only because he made a way. I can't wait to hear about the testimonies of how God made a way for some people this week. He loves you, cares for you, sees you. I love the ways of God. His ways are different, higher than our ways. So check this out. Verses 20. Four and five. Then King Nebuchadnezzar looked to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that we tied up? Notice the word tied, two words tied up, tied up. There were three guys that we tied up and threw under the fire because they were tied up. They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire unbound and harmed, and the fourth looks like the son of God. So check this out. You have actually three miracles. Ready? Here's the small miracle. Verse 21 says that they were bound. Verse 25 says they're no longer bound. That's a small one. In coffee terms, Starbucks would call it a tall miracle. <laughs> Here's the grande miracle. They look into the fire and there's not three people. There's, you want to hear the vente? The vente is, there's four. They're not dead. They don't even smell like smoke. They're unharmed. And the people that threw them into the fire, they got singed. That's the God that we serve. He's a miracle-working God. He's invincible. And because he's invincible, you and I are invincible. So, I don't know, Thursday, sermon was over. I had three cool points. All started with the right letter. I'm like, I'm done. Then I started thinking about the passage. I'm like, no, there's actually two more things, but the notes were already printed. And I'm like, I'm not going to make them print out another 4,000 notes or whatever. And it's too much work. So I'm just going to put it on you to fill in the last two things that I came up with on Thursday, Friday. Is that okay? These are free. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. These uh, two things I want to add, they're kind of like take-home points. Okay? So here, here it is. Two things I want you to write down. Number one, write this first thing down. If your faith is real... I'm talking about real, authentic, genuine. I'm not talking about one foot in the world, one foot in. I'm talking about the word is real. Ain't nothing like the real thing, baby. Ain't nothing like the real. If you have real, authentic, genuine faith, let me guarantee you, conflict is certain. With who? Name it. Family, friends, job, coworker, boss. It's coming. And the more fired up you are for Jesus, the more conflict you will have. I promise you, people, people ask all the time, like, what should I do with my parents? Because I used to, I was raised in the Catholic church like you were, Pastor Steve, and now I come to New Life, and they basically said I've abandoned the family and the church. And my family said the same thing. Well, Jesus said, unless you hate your father and your mother, your brother and your sister, you're not worthy to be my disciple. He's not saying that you should hate people. He's saying, no, if anybody's more important than my relationship with you, in other words, everybody has to have your love less than that you love Jesus. 
So, like, let the chips fall where they may. Don't be unkind or unloving, but you're going to have conflict in your life. I want you to look at a verse, 2 Corinthians chapter four, uh, 2, verse 14 and 15. Now he uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ. What? You didn't even catch that. Now he uses who? Does it say he uses pastors? He uses? Raise your hand if you're in us. This is so cool. God uses us. People are like, Pastor Steve, would you, is there any way you can come to my office on Wednesday? I've been telling somebody about Jesus, but they ask all these hard questions. And I don't know what to say. Can you? I'm like, no. God has you there because he wants you to share. Well, I don't really know that much. Well, God's got you there at your job, at your school, at your, on your baseball team, in your cubicle because he wants you to share. If you, if you don't know anything, just say, hey, I used to be like this. God saved me, and now I'm like this. That's what, you just tell people your testimony. He uses you to do what? Spread the knowledge of God. Why? Notice, it goes, our lives are like a Christ-like, say the word out loud, what? Rising up to God, but this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. So I got one of my favorite colognes. I liked your car. So in the first service, I came down here and I sprayed it. My son was sitting in the front row and it almost got in his eyes. So I'm not going to spray it in this service. And secondly, somebody said that some people are allergic to cologne, so I won't do it. But check this out. This verse says, we, as Christians, are a sweet perfume. We're like a fragrance. But notice, the two kinds of people. I'll do it this way. We're a fragrance to the people of God. So in other words, like when we, I, lo I love coming to church. How many love it? Because... What goes on in here is different than what happens at your job because at your job, they're cussing each other out, they're gossiping, they're telling about what they did on Friday night, they're bagging on the boss. But you come into here and you're like, Shh. let's all do that together, ready? Isn't it? You just get around the people of God, you're like, Shh. it's awesome. Some of you didn't even shower, but still, it's like, Shh. smells good. Isn't that true? So to, we're like a sweet perfume. Yeah to the people of God. We just get around. I just love being in church. I'm here four times every Sunday. I'm here on Wednesday night. Why? I just love being around the people of God. It's like a beautiful perfume. It's a great fragrance. That's why Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, do not forsake the gathering of the assembly. In other words, don't, don't not go to church because when we gather together, we encourage one another. Why? Because it's awesome. But notice, there's another fragrance that's sent to those that are perishing, those that are not Christians. One, one version says it's the, frag it's the aroma of death. So you go to your job and there's no Christians there and you're like, man, I went to church, it was awesome, man. We were, this new song, Defenders. You're, they're just like, shh, shh. Yeah. <laughs> you Christians are, you're so narrow. No, there's just like one way to get to heaven. You guys are so narrow. I, I, don't, I think it just matters. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. You guys see, you're so, you're so judgmental. You're so narrow. And to people that aren't serving God, it's like, shh, shh. they're just like, get out of here. Get out of the break room. Get out of my life. And what do they say? They say, Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. By the way, we are. You are. You're a hypocrite. <laughs> do you know that? So am I. Why? Because listen, Jesus, how many know he's perfect? And we're down here. We're imperfect. If you got saved last week, maybe you're here. If you're a pastor, you might be here. But let me know the gap between perfection and where you're at spiritually, that gap is hypocrisy. Because we know what God's word says. We're trying to live for God. There's always going to be a gap until we get to heaven one day. So every, all Christians are hypocrites. No, duh. Okay, but we're not our standard. Jesus is the standard. So they get around us and they're like, Christians, right? But to those that are saved, we're just like, shh, shh. Man, I love being at church. It's awesome. But I'm telling you, if you make a decision to serve Jesus Christ, there is going to be conflict. It's certain. It's not possible. It's certain. Key word is, here's the second thing I want to leave you with. Number two, if you stand for Jesus, he will stand for you. Come on, if you stand for Jesus, you say, man, I'm, I, I, I got to go to work tomorrow. I got to go to school. I got I to go to my family tomorrow, this week. I got to really stand for Jesus Christ. I promise when you make a decision to stand for him, Jesus Christ will stand for you. You got a verse or something to back that up? I do. Acts 7, I've used it when I've given invitation at the end of the message. So the first person that ever got killed or martyred for their faith was Stephen. 
So he's preaching to a bunch of Jews. He's like, hey, you, you're the ones that put Jesus on the cross. You're the one that mocked him. You're the one that killed him. And they're like, you little sucker. So they took out rocks and they actually killed him. And when he was dying in Acts chapter 7, check out this verse. Here's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 7, verse 55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, notice this, that you really can't take a strong stance for Jesus unless you're full of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus, full of the Holy, or Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus, key word, Jesus, that should shock you. Because you know the book of Hebrews is all about re the rest of the people of God. When Jesus, after he died, he rose again. And the Bible says he's seated at the right hand of the Father. Every time you read the New Testament, Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand. This is the only verse in the entire Bible where you see Jesus standing. Here's the question. Why is Jesus standing? The only time. Answer. Because Stephen was standing for Jesus on the earth, Jesus was standing for Stephen in heaven. Every time you and I take a stance for Jesus Christ on the earth, he will stand for you and I. So let me just end with this. Thursday night I was playing a new game. It's called pickleball. Combination of tennis, paddle tennis, racquetball, and UFC fighting. <laughs> the last part's not true. But it's played on a smaller tennis court with little paddles and a plastic ball, and it's like one of the fastest growing sports in the world right now. So I was playing on Thursday night, we were playing doubles. I, my partner was like 70 years old, and my friend had another partner who was probably in his 70s too. And um, so we started playing and F-bomb, F-bomb, F-bomb. My partner was just like cussing. And the guy's like 70, I'm like, just a couple of things that like, I, I don't think are attractive or like when really old people cuss and when ladies cuss, just this me. You can judge me, you can throw stuff at me. It's just like, so this guy's like, F this, F that, F this. And I'm just like, and then he says, he says, GD. Blank blanket. And I, I just feel like my heartbeat, like, I gotta say something, you gotta take a <laughs> So then the game was over and I went up to him after, because I don't want to be that Christian, like I'm so righteous, but I just put my hand on his shoulder. And I said, hey, can you do me a favor? And he said, sure. And I said, you know, when you were cussing, I didn't really say something, but anything, but when you used my Lord's name in vain. I said, it really offended me, so I would appreciate it if you wouldn't do that. And he goes, hey, no problem at all. I really apologize, and it was really awesome. Five minutes later, I went on another court, same thing, F, 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 just going back and forth, cuss, 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 same thing, G, D. So they're about to serve to me, and I just put my hand up, and I'm like, hold on a second. They're like, what? I'm like, hey, I'm not gonna probably say something if you cuss, but when you use my, the Lord's name in vain, I said, it really offends me. And like all the other guys are like, no, no problem. I apologize. And, and I didn't want to be that guy, you know, so you, but I had to stand up for, I mean, you're offending the God that died for me. So anyhow, the game continued. And one guy, he was the opponent. He, he, he missed a shot and he said, bull, fill in the blank. And then he saw him and he's like, bull, bulldog, bullfrog, bull. <laughs> But baloney, baloney. So then I had to walk over to Pastor Andrew and tell him, I said, you can't, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it wasn't Pastor Andrew. It was Pastor Crystal. Uh, just kidding. No, it was somebody else. But it was just, I, I knew that I, I couldn't let that go. I knew I had to take a stand. I don't know, maybe I'll probably have to do it again next time I play. And I might get who the blankety blank do you think you are? Let the chips fall where they may. When you stand for Jesus, he'll stand for you. Here, let me, I gotta, I gotta go, but let me say this. Here's what I want from everybody on our church. I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to think, like, I want you to think I'm incredible. And I want you to walk out every week and say, oh, man, he's so incredible, he's awesome, I love him. I love all of his messages. There's nobody that preaches like him. And that's what I, like my flesh wants. But I, I understand sometimes I'm gonna make you mad, it's okay. I, I've learned, because Jesus said, beware when all men speak well of you. So if every week in all four services, everybody's like, oh, he's incredible. I know that you're not gonna like what I say. It's okay. I'm just, I preach to an audience of one. Whether you like me or don't like me, it's not my pursuit. I don't even like what I say half of the time. <laughs> just be honest, it's hard to live for Jesus, but I'm not trying to win friends and influence people. I'm trying to preach the word of God and I'm trying to take a stand for Jesus Christ. And whether we have 40 people or 400 people or 4,000 people, God's in control. He said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. 
I just got to take a stand each and every time I stand up for Jesus. That's what God's word says. Preach it. Let the chips fall where they may. And that's how you need to live during the week. I'm going to stand for Jesus Christ regardless of the cost. How many would just echo that in your spirit? I'm going to stand for Jesus regardless of the cost. Listen, there's going to be a cost, but regardless of the cost. It might cost you some friends regardless of the cost. Might, it might mean that you might get fired regardless of the cost. If that's you, you know God's telling you, I need to stand for him regardless of the cost. I'm going to invite you right now. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Go ahead and stand to your feet right now. I'm going to pray for us. Four service here as we, we go out. We're going to sing one more song. But you know you need to take a stand for Jesus regardless of the cost. I'm going to invite those that are part of our prayer team to come forward right now. Can I take two or three minutes? Typically, here's how it it usually rolls on Sunday. I preach a message. You listen. Then at the end of the message, I tell you what you need to come forward for. But I'm not going to do that. The message is you need to take a stand for Jesus. And in a second, you need to come forward. Some of you have never publicly stood for Jesus Christ. You like the church. You like the worship. You like some of the songs we sing. You're like, this place is cool. I like the LED screens and the cameras, but you've you've never gone public in your faith. You need to come forward in just a little bit. Some of you have walked away from Jesus. At one time, you were on fire for God, and you've turned your back. You need to re-stand. And having done all, stand. Some of you need to take a stand. Look at me. You need to take a stand in purity. My son was up here at the end of the last service praying for a young gal who just moved out here from Florida, and she says, I've been, she told him, I've been dating someone that's not a Christian, and we've been sleeping around, and today I'm taking a stand. I'm not going to do that anymore. Would you pray with me and agree with me? Some of you need to make that commitment. Because I'm telling you, once you take a stand, the enemy is going to say, okay, we'll see how serious you are. And you tell your boyfriend, okay, we're not going to do it anymore until we get married. Do you think You don't think in like three days or five days he's going to call you or DM you and say, come on, just one more. Like, you need boldness. You need courage to take a stand for Jesus. Some of you need to take a stand in your faith. You've been at your job for three years, and the people that you work with don't even know you're a Christian. You need to show up tomorrow and say, hey, would you forgive me? For whatever reason, I was scared. I was afraid. I was fearful. I've never told you the most important person in my life is Jesus. Some of you need to take that stand. Some of you need to take a stand in your parenting, a stand in your marriage. I am not going to get a divorce because God hates divorce. I'm taking a stand. We're going to work it out. We're going to get some counseling. I'm taking a stand over my addiction. I'm going to go to recovery group on Thursday night. I'm serious about that. I'm going to ask some people to hold me accountable. You got to take a stand. You have to make a decision. And when you make the decision to stand, God says, there's my son, there's my daughter. I'm going to stand for you. And he'll give you the boldness and courage. So I don't know what you need to come forward for, but right now you need to get out of your seat, some of you, and come forward and let somebody pray with you and tell them, today I'm coming forward, I need to take a stance for you fill in the blank. Come on, all over the building, and who cares what people think? This is family right here. Stance for Jesus, stance is for purity, stand, stand in your conviction, just come forward let's, and just confess something to somebody. The Bible says if you confess your sin, he's faithful and just. If you're not coming forward, we're just going to worship the Lord and invite the presence of God in this place. But all over the building, I believe there's going to be a lot of people. you got to get out of your seat right now. The Holy Spirit's knocking on the door of your heart. Would you stand? Would you stand? Would you stand? Would you stand? As the worship team plays, I want you to get out of your seat right now. Go ahead, lead us, would you?